Good, good. All right, so we're about 150 here, starting to reach that threshold where we'll kick things off. Um, we did one of these sessions last month, and just the, the amount of participation was absolutely fantastic, right? That's what we're looking for again today. Um, this is a really exciting time, I think kind of an inflection point where machine learning is going from kind of a science project that's been off on the side that's you know only in academia or only in the largest corporations. It's becoming absolutely pervasive. So we're, we're here at this unique inflection point. And actually, I want to go ahead and maybe kick off a poll so we can kind of see where everyone is. Um, at VAST, like, you know, we've been, you know, in with the early adopters, right? So that's been one of our privileges to work with these super innovative customers. But we know we've got new people now, you know, joining. We want to kind of know where you are and it can help us, you know, push our discussion along. So another question, like, thing that don't be embarrassed to ask a question. If there's something that you haven't heard before, Kartik and Sven are the people to ask, right? They've been working with, with customers for years. They've got this extensive background. Um, awesome. Everybody's just jumping in here. Cool. Well, we're getting close to 200. Let's go ahead and, and kick things off. So uh, today's topic is all about infrastructure for artificial intelligence and machine learning. We're also going to talk about SuperPod. Um, and let's go ahead and, and jump to our intro slide so we can talk to the team. So I'll introduce myself first. I'm Steve Perchniewski. I'm on the product marketing team, and I'm joined by Kartik and Sven. Kartik, introduce yourself. Tell us what you do here. Hi, folks. Thank you so much for attending today. My name is Kartik. Uh, I'm Vice President for Systems Engineering at VAST. That's a, uh, a, a spot that I've held for the last three and a half years or so. Uh, prior to that, I was about 20 years at Dell, and I uh, was an academic before that and spent many years uh, doing physics prior to that. Um, I spend a lot of time with NVIDIA-based technologies, um, focusing on machine learning and deep learning. Uh, had the privilege of working with them for our base spot certification, bringing GP direct storage to market, as well as uh, most recently the SuperPod certification. So here to help in any way I can, guys. Excellent. Over to you, Sven. Yes, Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. This is Sven. I'm Field CTO International at Vast Data. I was born into the world of HPC back in 2005 when I joined the Fraunhofer Center for High Performance. Uh, computing. So uh, I see it as one of my advantages that I have been surrounded by a lot of uh, interesting HPC researchers uh, for many years. That's also where I developed one of these uh, parallel file systems, the one with the cute yellow uh, logo, and then joined VAST uh, about two years ago as the Field CTO International, where I helped to bridge the gap between our engineering, connecting it directly to the customers in both ways, right? To make sure that our engineering always perfectly understands the requirements from the field. And on the other hand, also to make sure that our customers perfectly understand where we're going and which new possibilities all these brings for them. Yeah. So I it just started to see the poll results come in. We've got a really good mix of people, you know, so a lot of people are just getting started though. So I guess one of my questions, you know, to you both, if I'm an IT journalist or I've been supporting, you know, kind of a, a standard enterprise workload for the past 10 years, what's the one thing that I should, you know, lean into? Do I need to discover InfiniBand? Is there something new that as an IT generalist, I might be surprised by? That's a great question, Steve. Uh, first off, the world of AI is broad, but you know, off late when people think about AI, they think about a subset of AI, which is called deep learning. Deep mm -hmm. learning requires neural networks uh, for the most part. There are other, other ways to do it too. But we are able to solve problems which were previously thought of as intractable, especially problems in computer vision, as well as problems in natural language processing, uh, which were very difficult computationally to do till the advent of GPUs. So first thing from an infrastructure side of things is get your heads wrapped around the idea of GPU-based computing. You're gonna find this in almost every single field. I do a ton of work in both life sciences and in machine learning and deep learning. And both of these are dominated with uh, GPU use. The traditional world of high-performance computing is no longer big parallel file systems with you know MPI jobs running on them. Every one of these clusters has uh, many GPUs mixed in it. And so we're coming up with an amalgam of these technologies, which are very new, which means of necessity, there's going to be other ways to do networking 
Uh, there is, of course, good old fashioned Ethernet based networking, which we're used to, but you got to amp up the volume a little bit on that. The old 10 gig, 25 gig, you know, back end networks no longer work. You need to go up to 100 gig, 200 gig, and beyond. InfiniBand is pretty heavily used too, as we go to large collections of GPUs working on problems. Not at all unusual to find systems where you have a thousand GPUs trying to solve the same problem running for months. This means that the GPUs need to talk to each other and they need to talk to whatever whatever's holding the data. This requires that sometimes you may not be able to do this with just Ethernet. You may need to use InfiniBand and other things like that. And thirdly, the characteristics of the storage which you're gonna be dealing with are gonna be very, very interesting. We'll speak a lot more about that. But over to Sven, um, any observations here? Yeah, I think the, the thing that surprises people a lot is that running uh, actual serious production workloads is somewhat different from the initial uh, AI testing that many do, right? If you start uh, looking into AI, very often it's the relatively small experimental use cases, which you can run on your uh, single box uh, with the internal drives and so on. And then uh, suddenly it turns out when you try to scale that to actual serious production stuff, then things are a lot different, right? Suddenly the network as Cardic uh, set starts to matter. The storage system starts to matter because you need fast sh shared storage between uh, everything. You need knowledge for how to organize uh, multiple machines between different users. That's how AI and HPC, in my opinion, uh, always converge, right? HPC provides the knowledge and technology for how to scale AI workloads. So if you have knowledge in this domain, it's certainly helpful. The other thing that I think anyone doing AI should always embrace is that at the moment there, well, always when you start a journey, it's good to know the goal, right? Where where are you actually uh, going? What will be the outcome? But for AI, the interesting thing is that you're shaping the future along the way, right? There is no clear goal. We have no idea where this will end and what the possibilities will be in the end. So that's certainly something to embrace along the way as well, I think. Yeah, and flexibility is really important. You don't want to paint yourself in a corner. And that's something I'm sure we'll touch on too. But yeah, yeah. one more quick uh, comment just to add on to what, what Sven said. It jogged my mind on something. There's a cultural aspect to working in AI, which cannot be ignored. It's a people aspect to this whole thing. Uh, all, many of us came from a pretty transactional storage background. We run relational databases, we run Oracle and SQL Server and VMware and run ERP systems and CRM systems. And in those application stacks were very mature. And therefore you could focus on just our domain of interest, which is CPU memory, you know, uh, uh, storage and network. Uh, AI is still very much in its infancy, like uh, Sven pointed out. <clears throat> and very often you'll see that the practitioners, the so-called data scientists of the world and the uh, analysts of the world, have some experience running it on the cloud, but they really don't have a good understanding of infrastructure. Conversely, infrastructure people don't have a very good idea what is actually being run. You'll hear terms like PyTorch and TensorFlow and large language models and GPT-3 and things like that thrown around. And it behooves you and behooves us to understand a little more about how to communicate with the end user in this case. Uh, the what they know is very different from what we know in infrastructure. And the people who are most effective are ones who are willing to put in the extra effort to bridge the gap and understand their language. And conversely, if you have people on, on the application side, for them to understand a little better what infrastructure is, that's just going to pay off huge dividends. Back to you, Steve. Excellent. So we're starting to get our first questions in. So we've got a question here. With the size of the model and data scaling much faster than RAM or other hardware, such as CXL capacities, how can the system side design innovate to help boost machine learning performance? That's a great question. Uh, scale has traditionally been something that has always been in the mindset of people doing large scale AI, especially machine learning and deep learning. Uh, there's several things that happen. First is data volume is growing almost uncontrollably. Uh, it is, I, we are in the middle of deploying a 200 petabyte system right now for one of our customers. 
to do a mixture of a large number of things. Some of it is very data intensive. Some of it is very GPU intensive over here. Uh, the second thing is, as you correctly point out, models are getting ridiculously big. Uh, they're too big to fit in a GPU's memory, like the state-of-the-art H100 GPUs from NVIDIA, for example, are 80 gigabyte machine. Uh, you, you know, yeah, basically the memory is 80 gigabytes. You look at a model like GPT-3, it's, it's huge. It's 175 billion parameters, and it's about you know, over 500 gigabytes in size. It is not going to fit on a single GPU for sure. That's the first point. Secondly, the amount of time required to train it is going to be exponentially high if you just do it on one server. You need a cooperation of multiple servers to be able to do this. So some very interesting techniques have been developed to spread the uh, workload across multiple servers, across multiple GPUs, all having access to the data, but maybe even just working on some part of the data one at a time. So there's a massive amount of parallel work that goes on to scale, both at the model level as well as the level of the data called model parallel and data parallel, obviously. And so using a combination of these techniques is how we actually get to build very, very large models and train over very, very large sets of data. Makes sense. So do you see most of these workloads being extreme, like, like one or two giant workloads, or do we expect as, you know, kind of AI becomes across every workload that you'll have systems that need to handle multiple workloads? Like, you know, kind of my, I, you know, we talked about HPC and ML kind of in the same breath. Are these incompatible? How do we handle multiple workloads in the same infrastructure? How do we slice and dice? Oh, it's, absolutely, there's going to be multiple uh, use cases here. Typical AI systems that we've deployed have hundreds of users. Not all jobs are like massive jobs requiring hundreds of thousands of GPUs. Many of them will run just fine on much a much more modest amount. You just have a lot of them. In, in, in the way we manage it is actually not that dissimilar from what was done in the HPC world. Uh, anyone coming from there knows that there are, um, you know, configuration management tools out there, uh, and there are schedulers out there. Common schedulers like Slurm, for example, are still very much in use in the world that we live in in AI today. So you would have job scheduling done as jobs come in across the GPU farms that you have. And people would be able to run, submit jobs, run, look at the output, reiterate, do all the kind of stuff, just like you did with uh, more traditional HPC, HPC type workloads. Now there is a new actor in town. People realize that there's a huge benefit to using containers in these kind of workloads. And I'm extensively seeing use of both Docker and Singularity in this space but actually in a more orchestrated fashion. Uh, that one of the control planes for the superpod, for example, is expected to be Kubernetes. So Kubernetes, you know, superpod support both Sloan as well as Kubernetes. So expect to get used to those kind of methods to be able to schedule a workload and to be able to have a multi-user system to be able to share the GPU resources that are available. I'd love to see what Sven has to say to that because he is an HPC heavy. He's smarter than me, but I'm better looking and I'm going to stick to that. Go ahead, Sven. <clears throat> yeah. It's maybe not a direct answer to the question, but it, it reminds me of a general trend uh, that I have been seeing. Right? So in, in, in answer to the uh, question that was asked about how to prepare for everything, yeah. Make sure you remain flexible and are not locked in, right? That the system doesn't have an inherent scalability limit uh, or anything like that. That's the seemingly uh, trivial answer to that. The uh, other side of it is I think that we're moving into a new era where the data scientists are really less interested in uh, in that old school stuff that we did back in the days where we spent a lot of time optimizing our low level C programs or assembler stuff uh, to do nice things to the CPUs or GPUs or uh, the storage system uh, and so on. Nowadays, people use uh, Python a lot, certainly not because it's the, <laughs> the fastest language that you can use, uh, more because they are more interested in the results, right? So that's another uh, reason why the systems nowadays just have to be 
able to handle whatever the users throw at them and the users will not be nice to the systems like they tried in the past. Instead, the users just want to get their stuff done. They want to see uh, results and not spend uh, huge time uh, on writing code because they have these smart ideas. They want to write them down quickly and then they want to run stuff. Does that make sense? I just assume yes. So I, I know we had another a large service provider who was focused on oil and gas exploration, right? And that was one of their kind of goals in setting up their infrastructure is they wanted to ensure that if someone did something that was less than optimal, that it didn't impact the rest of their customers. So I think that's probably where you're going there. So Carpet, do you want to expand on that question about microservices and containers? I don't know if everybody saw that in chat. Sure. I, just... I, I just typed in an answer, but let, let me go ahead and answer that. And the next question also from Gopi, which is over here. Uh, yeah, so uh, you absolutely can can uh, construct full fledged microservices applications uh, for across across the kids environment. Uh, and NVIDIA has a very nice library uh, called the NGC library, and NGC basically has uh, a set of containers which have which are sometimes are based on common frameworks like this containers for PyTorch or TensorFlow or what have you. Uh, I use them all the time because I'm lazy and I don't really want to go, you know, do a, do an install on bare metal. So I'll download a container that'll have the right versions of CUDA, that'll have the right versions of everything on it. And then, and I'm able to use that and I can stick it and I can make a part out of it and have that orchestrated uh, inside Kubernetes as well. So, Extensive use of containerization, especially with Docker, is done across the board in in deep learning. Uh, there are people who run bare metal, but uh, mostly people love to run in containers because uh, the stack is 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 fairly intricate, and therefore you don't want to mess with dependencies from the operating system. Neither do you want to change the operating system in a way that may break something else for someone else. So that encapsulation that containerization gives and the orchestration capabilities that Kates gives are actually really, really elegant in the context of AI. Uh, so quick question for the, the one for Gopi. Are there plans to come up with uh, solutions to run on commodity hardware of Dell, Lenovo, Supermicro, et cetera? Uh, much of our work is with NVIDIA GPUs. This doesn't mean that we haven't tested other kinds of GPU or GPU-like uh, offerings out there, like from Samanova or uh, Intel's Habana or GraphCore or something like that. But the 800-pound gorilla today is most certainly is NVIDIA in this field. Uh, NVIDIA actually uh, OEMs the hardware and the software to a variety of vendors, of server vendors, just like the ones you mentioned. So these systems, NVIDIA systems are called DGX line and uh, they are specifically engineered by nvidia and sold by nvidia on a very specific purpose uh, all the other server vendors have a similar offering called the hgx they actually use the same motherboards and the same gpus as the dgx does but they have a different uh, server uh, form factor and they have other ways to be able to do this so uh, so that's how uh, they operate uh, all of them. Dell has one, HTX has one, uh, HP has one, Lenovo has one, uh, Supermicro has one. They all have these HTX systems. And they are equivalent from a hardware performance standpoint. Uh, the, the prescriptive reference architectures like the SuperPod uh, also uh, specify how the networking is done. So they're a little more turnkey solution. And NVIDIA has a lot of other resources along with it. But at the end of the day, it's the customer's choice on how they want to work with it, okay? Uh, oh, my question is more running VAST on commodity hardware, not GPU systems. Uh, we actually have multiple providers for VAST hardware at this point. Uh, we have, uh, obviously we have multiple generations inside VAST itself, uh, who where we run with and recently, uh, you know, Hewlett Packard Enterprise has OEM vast software to be able to run as well on hardware that they build. So they have their own hardware stack that they build. They actually use TLC drives, not, not QLC drives, but architecturally it's the same. Our intellectual, we're a software company, our intellectual properties and the software. So you do have a choice of multiple hardware providers to be able to run this on, and that's only going to expand over time. 
In addition, we will be introducing a version of VAST very soon, which will run on AWS. So that, of course, will be a purely software-defined VAST, but we'll be able to federate that along with a lot of other stuff over here, okay? So another question here. Can you keep answering here. questions, or do we want to... Um, well, go ahead and pop into the slides, and I'm going to ask you the next question. We're going to keep things moving along. Again, please keep the questions coming. We don't really have a set agenda other than your questions, except we do have a demo that Sven's going to do, and we absolutely want to get to that. Um, uh, yeah. Yes. So cover this slide, and then I'll ask you the next question. So Yeah. So are there, are there best practices for integrating with Ceph and with S3? Um, I hardly see any object anywhere in the deep learning world. Uh, technically, frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch do support S3 backends, but almost in every single case that I have seen, the exposure of the data is through a file. Uh, it was a file exposure through POSIX. So uh, while you could potentially use objects, and I can certainly see that being interesting as namespaces get extremely large, uh, because no one wants to traverse an inode tree for 200 petabytes at one time. Uh, it, it is not, not mainstream. I see objects much more in environments like Spark or Trino uh, or NoSQL structures like Cassandra, rather than I see it in more traditional PyTorch or TensorFlow type environments than anything else. Generally speaking, that's file. In fact, if you look at the reference architectures from NVIDIA for both for the base pod systems and the super pod, the exposure is purely file. The, hmm. the system expo expects to see a mount point and it expects to see, see all the data on this mount point and it expects to see every single machine in the cluster to be able to see exactly the same namespace. But that's uh, certainly a good uh, thing regarding uh, remaining flexible, right? The fact that VAST is a multi-protocol system, so at any point in time, you can just have S3 access to all of the existing data and also ingest new data via S3, if that makes sense for your ETL uh, pipeline or whatever. Uh, with respect to the uh, integration uh, with Ceph or any other uh, storage system for that matter. Of course, there are always uh, other software packages that can run on top of an arbitrary file system and move data around. And so there are plenty of these, but in general, our simple ambition is that VAST should be the last storage system uh, you'll ever need, right? So that's why <laughs> there's not really an ambition from that point of view to integrate uh, with other storage systems. Yeah, here's an interesting question. Is VAST multi-protocol at the same time uh, or do you have to pick it when it's installed? It is multi-protocol at the same time. You basically have the ability to access any data within the system through any protocol at any given time. You basically, we will expose protocol endpoints to all protocols. We'll support NFS uh, three and four, SMB two and three, as well as S3 and anything can be read or written to through any of these protocols uh, as needed. Mm. I think that the kind of multi-protocol workflow is, is kind of interesting where maybe you're collecting over S3 or object because you've got multiple sources, but then ultimately it's going to land somewhere where you then want to turn on NFS so you can chew on it with your GPUs. Absolutely. We have people in the medical field who have instrumentation, which is still based on old Windows machines, which writes SMB. So they can write directly to our systems with SMB and then process the data through NFS. And that is, we have people in production environments who are doing that today. Okay, you know, so a few comments on SuperPod. Uh, SuperPod is, uh, I would say the Cadillac uh, architecture or reference architecture from NVIDIA. It was built for extremely large scale computational problems. Large language models, like I mentioned, are not only big in size, being several hundred gigabytes and unable to fit in uh, memory for a single GPU, uh, but they also require a lot of computational power. In fact, this actually dominates the performance characteristics for most production workloads in super pods is they will peg your GPUs and virtually every other thing will be idle. GPUs start to become the bottleneck for these kind of workloads. SuperPod is a very specific prescriptive architecture to be able to scale. The DGX H100 SuperPod, DGX H100 being 
NVIDIA's flagship server, which has eight GPUs. Uh, it, the minimum size for a super pod is called a scalable unit, and a scalable unit consists of 32 such DGX H100s. That would be an equivalent of 256 H100 GPUs. Uh, the intent of all of them being working in concert with each other. These were talked to each other through a very robust uh, RDMA fabric based on InfiniBand. Uh, in fact, these systems are NDR uh, based, uh, which is the latest generation of InfiniBand supporting 400 gigabit. And uh, for superpod architectures, uh, InfiniBand is mandatory, both for the storage as well as for the compute fabric. Both those fabrics are IB fabrics. As you can see, the requirements for the super pod are pretty stringent. They do have a good, better, best categorization of what kind of performance they require. And this is only a partial set of requirements. The actual certification requires a lot more testing for buffered IO, for how that scales, how the multiple threads, et cetera. But the top line numbers we want to aim for for the best category for a single scalable unit, i.e. 32 of these DGX H100s is 125 gigabytes a second read throughput and 62 gigabytes a second write throughput. I should mention that generally speaking, most, you know, AI, this is the key thing I want storage guys in the audience to understand. Uh, AI tends to be heavy read. I mean, almost 95% read and very low write, but the read is also very different from what you traditionally have in HPC environments where uh, traditional HPC is large block sequential reads and writes. AI is on, in contrast, small block, a small to medium block random IO. This is a key aspect of artificial intelligence, especially deep learning workloads is the uh, IO pattern is dominated by random IO and they're dominated by random reads more than anything else, okay? Uh, so that is, is actually something that is super suited for solid state as a medium because solid state doesn't care much of whether it's random or sequential. And therefore all the reference architectures that NVIDIA or any other GPU provider has ever baselined or had reference architectures with all of them are basically based on solid state. They are not based on any hard drive technologies. So this is kind of key. Just for reference, when we tested our systems, the super pod we tested with was a DGX A100 uh, super pod. It was one before where the scalable unit is 20 DGXs. Uh, we were aiming to meet the H100 requirements and we met and far exceeded that. We were able to get we are the systems we shipped are capable of doing over 400 gigabytes a second reads, as well as, uh, oh, you know, well, well, you know, also over 62 gigabytes a second, which is specified here. That being said, I want to caution your people to not get blinded by these top line numbers. These are not necessarily needed in most applications. Large language model training specifically needs high bandwidth, mainly for checkpoints and restores not for regular operation. Regular operation, the GPUs get pegged and you'll hardly see any IO on the subsystem, but you do need the performance when you do checkpoints for writes and checkpoint restores is when you need the read performance more than anything else. So we easily meet the bar for all of that and that's really what we want to do. Uh, quick question uh, on the screen. Sven, you want to take this? Assuming stripe size is configurable and uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's one of the beauties uh, of FAST. I, I think I'll get back to that when I show the architecture slide in a few minutes from now, then I'll talk about the striping. Uh, striping. But generally, yes, the assumption is that the system can uh, stripe single large files uh, across multiple servers to get aggregate performance, even for a single large file. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. So we'll cover that one. So, I mean, just for people that are new, and again, I don't know this myself, like what happens at checkpointing? Like I'm going to run a job that, that's going to go for weeks at a time. Why is checkpointing so important? So, so checkpointing is necessary because you have so many actors who are participating in the act of training. Uh, I, I should I should probably clarify. I kept using the term training, uh, you know, assuming everybody knows it. Uh, Processing for deep learning models is basically the two core tasks that are done. The first is training where you expose the neural network to data 
over and over again till it learns the data and is able to make a prediction for data it hasn't seen, which is uh, very accurate. Uh, common examples would be say something like Facebook's deep face algorithms, which was able to recognize you have all your family's pictures and put names to them probably better than you can, whether they're wearing glasses or not, whether they're wearing a dress or they're wearing a shirt, you know, it doesn't matter. It'll recognize them right away. Uh, that's because it's been trained. The second part of this is something called inference. And this is actually when the model is used purely to be able to make a prediction, not, not to train. Training is much more GPU intensive than inferences. That's why you need a very large number of machines to do that. But inference is actually not at all computationally uh, intense. This is why I say a Tesla automobile can actually have their most sophisticated model running right on the car because all it does is inference. It really doesn't do any training. In the backhaul, these kind of people have like thousands and thousands of GPUs which actually do the training. Same thing true for things like ChatGPT, et cetera. Uh, the training requires a lot. The inference requires much, much less than that, okay? Uh, That's a really good example. I like the, the Tesla one. It makes sense. That's how your car can can recognize a dog from a, from a van. That's awesome, I like that. Got it. So yeah, if you, if you go on to the next slide, and actually I should really run through these very fast because I don't want to shortchange uh, Sven on his demo. So there are, I, I just wanted to highlight three common, I would say myths or misconceptions that people run into when they're looking at storage decisions in specifically built towards you know, deep learning. First is the GPU-based workloads. Just because they got a lot of GPUs, you're going to need a ton of I.O. And uh, in fact, if you need a ton of I.O., there are times you'll need some I.O., but like I mentioned, through checkpoint restores, et cetera, the GPUs tend to be the long pole in the tent for most of these workloads. And when you have a large amount of data volume, you generally get the performance you need anyway. Performance is not really the bottleneck. The IO stack does, is not always the bottleneck in, in these kind of things. There are other nuanced ways that IO, IO is bottleneck. I'll speak about that in a second. I'll give you an example. You know, a university customer come to me and tell me, uh, hey, uh, I was told by vendor X that uh, I needed 200 gigabytes a second, uh, 9 million IOs a second for half a petabyte of data. And I'm going to run some deep learning workloads and I'm going to buy some big GPU systems. Do you have a system that fits that? And I was like, you got to be joking. I've never seen anything pushing that kind of IO with half a petabyte of data. Uh, what are you planning to run on this? And he said, well, I got these material science codes I'm running. It's an encoder decoder model. And we've been working on this and it runs on the PyTorch, blah, blah, blah. I said, can you give me the model and some data? Let me actually measure what this does. And the customer was kind enough to give me, give me the Jupyter notebook and give me a data sample. And I ran that, we have a DGXA 100 in our labs and I ran that and I benchmarked it. And uh, surprise, surprise, the IO workload that it needed was 15,000 IOs a second. Quite a bit different from the 9 million that they'd been told. So. Be cautious when, when you hear that these big numbers are what really make the difference over here. They're not, they're very workload specific, which brings me to point two, which is often people will see things which are based on synthetic benchmarks. Like a common thing I've seen is vendors will use HPC benchmarks to be able to characterize IO uh, for AI uh, subsystems. Uh, uh, you know, so if I say take something like IO500, which is not at all a bad benchmark as such, it uses a combination of benchmarks for metadata performance and for data performance. And it's probably a decent one for HPC workloads uh, because it focuses on large block sequential workloads, et cetera. But that's not what happens in an AI world. That small block random is what you're looking at for AI workloads. These tend to be uh, extremely inaccurate in being able to predict how a particular workload would actually work in this kind of a system. And uh, they're highly misleading in trying to compare uh, how these systems uh, work. 
you should be focusing on small block random benchmarks. Those are the ones that really, really will make the difference between night and day when it comes to running AI workloads. <clears throat> so the third point is people will assume because they haven't had the experience with it and that if we buy the highest performing system in the market today, that's gonna automatically guarantee that you're gonna have good AI performance. I can give you dozens of counter examples to that. One workload that I work with extensively is a workload called AlphaFold. AlphaFold is a protein folding code. There was a deep learning model released by DeepMind, which is a subsidiary of Google, which is now virally used, especially because of COVID and everybody trying to figure out how spike proteins in COVID work and how antibodies uh, can be developed to fight COVID and other similar pathogens. Uh, AlphaFold is run extensively across the entire structure, bio structure biology uh, you know, uh, uh, ecosystem. Fascinating thing about AlphaFold is that when you run with VAST, we run as fast as local NVMe, which is pretty much the gold standard. But in many other parallel file systems, it runs 2x slower, maybe 3x slower, slower as, man, as much as 7x slower on us. And the mystery was why. That's because it's not the amount of IO you do. If you actually look and see how much IO it's doing, it doesn't seem like too much. Uh, any system should be able to handle it. It's the type of IO that matters. AlphaFold uses something called memory map files. But when it has a large date files and AlphaFold uses a large reference database, which is too big to fit in memory, then it will map it to shared memory. And then you get what looks like a flood of random 4K IOs coming to the storage system because it's a demand paging system. It only pulls in the data when the data is requested as opposed to loading everything up in memory. When you do that, then we shine and that causes all kinds of problems for other storage systems. Even though the other storage systems will tout, I got the highest IO, IOPS and I got the highest throughput. Be very, very careful when making those decisions. My advice, run your real workload to really decide what's best as opposed to taking either synthetic benchmark or buying systems blindly based on high throughput. So. With that, I'm going to hand over to Sven, and uh, Sven, basically We've, take it away. I think it's good to got know. Got a couple of questions, and then Please. to your point, Kartik, like that customer was willing to share their model with you, yeah, so that you could run it and show them the real world. That's something yeah. that customers should be comfortable when they're looking at storage infrastructure, asking their IT partners to do right. I mean, to yeah. to actually spend that time. You bet. You should. They should. Uh, they should they should demand that whichever vendor they are going to pick uh, yeah. demonstrate that their workloads actually run on the platforms that they profess will be suitable for this. And similarly, the due diligence which is done uh, by the customer and customer themselves should not be limited to only running synthetic benchmarks. And we should actually look and see what real life workloads look like. I spend most of my time running real life workloads here, uh, Steve, mainly yeah. because I am skeptical, not just of other vendors, I'm skeptical of our, our own uh, uh, technology as well. So I, I'm not confident going in front of our customers and saying, we'll do well for you unless I've actually run that workload myself. So yeah. we should do that due diligence guys. That's actually probably a big difference from what we would do in a transactional world on a more traditional world. There, you could look at IOPS and you could look at bandwidth and say, okay, the storage system is right. sufficient for my needs. It's a lot more nuanced in uh, in the case of deep learning workloads. Mm. It's uh, well worth actually testing before you find out where the stuff works. So, uh, there was a question about uh, IO patterns being different from HPC, parallel IO. Do you see a divergence in storage config based on the workload? I think we've touched on that a little bit, but maybe as yeah. Sven kicks off as demo, we can... Yeah, so first of all, scale is absolutely, no question about it, is important. And please do not interpret anything I said in, into meaning that performance is not important. It's the right kind of performance that's important, okay? That absolutely is needed. Uh, more and more, I think the where AI is going is we are getting past the era of hard drives or tiering of data anymore. 
AI requires democratic access to all the data. And because of its random nature, tends to be all flash is the media that you end up doing. And lastly, and this is probably more important than anything else, when it comes to large dynamic namespace usage in AI environments, ease of use and simplicity is absolutely key. Yeah. Uh, it's not no longer sufficient that you know system A gets storage, you know this storage, and system B gets that. All the systems have to see the entire namespace evenly at all times. So any performance you look at should be for a single mount point, not necessarily for an aggregate of mount point. You're very rarely gonna segment your data. So different systems see different stuff, which is a radical departure from the more enterprise applications that most of us uh, actually came through. So yeah, all flash, simplicity, scale, ease of use. Um, I mean, I should not never forget cost. <laughs> yeah, at the Perfect. end of the day. Yeah, so you yeah, know, you all, all it, the stuff right? has so. got to be affordable. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. And yeah. these these are to me some of the key criteria that you got to look at. The appropriateness of the storage to the workload uh, is paramount. Mm. Sense biggest thing. Mm. Very fun fact is that I just lost access to our lab systems. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all right. so maybe we won't have a live demo. That's, that's the magic of, of a live demo, right? You never know what's going to happen. So let me no call you, no glory, you know, as they say. Mm -hmm. yeah. While you see if you can yeah. sort that, we have another question. What are the recommended best practices for deploying AI infrastructure that support both training and inference? Because as you mentioned, they're they're very different. Um, so how do you, do you completely overbuild to, to do incredibly fast training or do you go a little bit less with the idea that you're going to spend most of your time in inference anyway? Yeah, so that's a good question. Inference tends to be, interestingly enough, much more IO intensive than training. Reason should be self-evident. Training is heavily GPU constrained because the act of training requires two things, and you people may have heard those terms before. There's, uh, there's forward propagation and then there's back propagation. Uh, forward propagation is when I take it, you know, through to the end of the neural network. Back propagation is when the neural network learns it's wrong and corrects itself by taking everything back uh, through the whole system. Back propagation is extremely intense on GPUs. As a result, when you're doing training, GPUs are pegged. I/O systems are idle, not idle, but you know, much not not I/O bound. Uh, inference can be the opposite. Because there is no back propagation, it's only a forward pass for inference. The GPUs don't really do that much work. So then the bottleneck shifts to the IO subsystem. Key thing is that ask if you can deliver line bandwidth to your GPU servers uh, in being when you're trying to read the data in for inference. If the technology stack you've you've chosen is chosen wisely then that should not be a bottleneck for you. This goes back to the earlier point I made about single mount points. So I may not need that much from a single mount point when I'm doing training, but when I'm doing inference, I may need a lot more. So I, there's an image uh, classification benchmark I run called DeepCam. And DeepCam as an inference benchmark, it's basically a, it's a, it's basically it's it's like you know a climate model. And uh, this one. You know, when you're training it, maybe just like, you know, a few gigabytes a second. When you're doing inference, it can pull 40 gigabytes a second. That point you want to ask, what system can actually pull 40 gigabytes a second to a single client, to a single mount point for their GPUs? So I can run it at full tilt. So you don't necessarily have to build different systems for training and inference. You can absolutely share that uh, infrastructure if you like. Some people do have separate inference servers. I'm not going to say no. They will segregate a couple of servers just for inference. But it depends on your workload and depends on whether you're training all the time or you're doing inference all the time. So uh, it's, it's environment specific, but whatever it is, your technology should be able to handle it. <laughs> Makes sense. So I'm yeah. going to share the results. And I should have done this before. But you know, one of the things that I keep thinking about here is like, you know, if I talk to somebody who's been in HPC for a long time, they're going to have a proclivity to say that I need a parallel file system. And so we've got this you know, banner up here, can NFS be fast enough? And, and kind of looking at this poll with you know, most of the respondents just getting started, they won't have that 
kind of, you know, prejudgment against any one file system, right? So people are going to be more open to different ideas. So I think that's kind of interesting. But Sven, I know we're having difficulty getting through uh, through the VPN, but do you want to kind of dig into, you know, how NFS is now, yes. you know, kind of coming from a second class, you know, protocol to, you know, being to the forefront here? Yeah, right. That's indeed something I'm uh, facing all of the time that people think NFS cannot be fast enough for AI, right? Because they tried NFS in the past and they very often loved their NFS uh, filers for all the nice features that they provide and the easy management and so on. And when they try running scale out performance workloads on them, then they typically fail, which kind of created the impression that NFS would be generally slow and not appropriate for high performance. But as a matter of fact, NFS is just a protocol specification, right? The, a protocol specification does not have a speed associated with it. It's just a specification. So it always depends on how you implement the service behind the specification, whether the result is fast or slow. So in that sense, uh, VAST had to come up with a new architecture to solve that problem because it's clear if we can offer everything through NFS, then things become so much more convenient if you don't have to worry about how users access the data from their laptops, right? Because with NFS and SMB and S3, the standard protocols, it's always easy to access everything without having to install a proprietary client and so on. So how did we solve this uh, through the special architecture? The vast architecture is basically split into two layers for this reason. At the top layer, we have here what we call the protocol servers. Each small box that you see here represents uh, an individual server. Some of them are grouped together in a single enclosure, right? And then you can have multiple enclosures. At the bottom layer here, completely separate from that, we have the NVMe enclosures. And now comes the special thing. We connect everything in the back end, completely independent of how you connect it to your clients, to your GPU servers. In the back end, we connect it in a way that each individual protocol server where the NFS, SMB, and S3 service runs is really connected to all of the drives in the back end. And actually, all of these servers fully equally own all of the drives and with it all of the data that we store in the back end. That's very different from classic NFS architectures where you have something like a FAT controller uh, that runs the NFS service. And behind that controller, you can do scale up in the sense of adding more drives. But at some point, you will hit that controller uh, limit, and then it won't scale anymore. You can only add more capacity, but not more performance. That's very different in the vast architecture here. Every server that you add adds more performance. Every drive that you add adds also more capacity. And you can grow infinitely because uh, any I.O. to the system can come in through any of the servers, and that server will be able to go directly to the drives uh, and either read the data or modify the data. And now that uh, gets us back to the striping question that was asked earlier. In this model, even if a single large file comes in through only one of these servers, maybe because the NFS client just connected to that single server, then even that single server will be able to stripe the single large file across all of the drives that we have in the system. So if you afterwards read that file back from many GPU nodes, then you have the full nice aggregate performance of everything because it's already laid out fully parallel across uh, everything. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. I, this is unrelated to AI, but like even now ESX, you know, VMware ESX is supporting NConnect. So it's just about being able to spread those connections. And so mm -hmm. when I first hired on, one of the engineers showed me, he logged on to one of the nodes and did an NVMe, essentially NVMLS command and could see every single NVMe device. And he's like, it doesn't matter how many of these enclosures we add, every single one of these still sees it. There's no partition. And that was kind of like, for me, a real eye opener. Like that's how it works. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this has a number of other nice uh, advantages for resilience, which I'll not go uh, into too much for time reasons now. But in general, right, if you have, let's say, 100 servers here on top, 99 of them can actually fail. And the remaining single one will still happily serve all of your data because each of the servers is also running NFS, SMB, and S3 at the same time and provides access to the full namespace, right? Obviously not with the performance that you previously had from 100 right. servers, 
but you're still up and running, which is of course a great. Uh, yeah, just to add to that a little bit, you know, we do no caching anywhere in this architecture. There's no read cache and no write cache. So we have no cache coherency issues as this thing scales. This is why we're able to build namespaces, which are 50, 100, 200 petabytes or so with no loss in performance as we scale out. We also have no east-west traffic in the cluster for the reasons that Sven just pointed out, because every container or every server on the on, uh, on the level of the protocol uh, can see the entire namespace. So it needs to talk to none of its neighbors at all. There's no east-west traffic in this cluster either. Those two things alone give our ability to scale with no problem at all. The actual striping of the data is a completely internal affair. You would never have to actually touch it or choose a stripe size or anything. We do it in a way to maximize the lifetime for the dense NAND that we use. Now this one shows QLC. Frankly, we can use TLC as well. And in fact, HPE uh, uses TLC for that. We're not really tied to the hardware. We're a software company. Uh, we can make use with anything. Our main goal is to make things inexpensive for the customer. So we choose the cheapest one that we can. So the internal striping has the ability to be able to deal with any, any data of any size. We, can, we are bite granular in our structure. So we can go to an arbitrarily small size and we can also go to arbitrarily large size uh, files as well. Yeah, and we have another question uh, asking, there must be the concept of a metadata service like with yeah. Luster anything we have to worry about. As a matter of fact, of course, there is metadata in the system, right? File attributes, file names, and so on. All this is metadata, but there is no extra metadata service. We simply don't need it because all of the servers, similar to how they equally own the file contents, they also equally own all of the metadata. So any metadata request really can come in through any of the servers, and that server can directly interact yeah. with the corresponding drives where this piece of the metadata is located. That, of course, also helps a lot to avoid hotspots in the system, right? Because not all of the clients that want to uh, interact with a certain directory have to come in through that single server that might own this directory, because all of them equally own all of the directories, which maybe creates the question of how do you actually make the clients talk to all of the uh, different servers in this model? For that, in the very simple case, we run what we call a DNS round robin service uh, on the protocol servers here. It's just a service that automatically runs on them. Um, so each of the clients uses the same server host name to do the NFS mount or the SMB or S3 mount. But this DNS round robin service will return a different server IP address for every client that does the mount. So that's how automatically different clients get assigned to different servers. And that's how we easily get the aggregate performance of the whole system. In many cases, uh, that's already good enough because out of a single server uh, connection, we can already get like 10 gigabytes per second. So already quite a good number for a single client. But then as you know, at some point, NVIDIA came up with this nice concept of the DGX uh, boxes or the HGX reference uh, design where you have plenty of GPUs inside a single server together with a bunch of network cards. So in these cases, maybe 10 gigabytes per second per client are no longer good enough. Uh, so to solve this problem, we did a small extension to the standard NFS client that we call NFS multipathing. Oh, I see there's a typo here. It's not multipacking, it's multipathing. Um, that means we took the standard NFS client that comes with Linux and added as an extension that you can specify a number of client-side interfaces if you have many inside the client, and that you can also specify a range of server IP addresses. And then the client, the single client through the single mount point really goes and connects to multiple of these servers in parallel and really sends different requests in parallel to the different servers, um, which of course, uh, enables the aggregate performance uh, for a single NFS client mount point. Uh, in the NVIDIA lab and also at various customer sites, we have demonstrated that this way we can get over 160 gigabytes per second out of a single 
uh, NFS client mount point, which doesn't mean that all of the AI workloads really need the sweet throughput, but it's sure comforting to know that you could get there if you should ever uh, really. Yeah, need. I'll, I'll give you a, a simple case in point. Superpath certification requires that a single node be able to drive line bandwidth for two of the NICs that are connected to the storage subsystem. That's 40 gigabytes a second read throughput that you have to demonstrate to pass the superpath certification. We're able to do that with ease because we use multipathing, even though each of those, you know, stateless servers can only deliver 10 gigabytes a second. We can distribute that workload across the entire cluster. And that allows us to bring pretty much arbitrary amounts of bandwidth to a single system. And I was uh, fortunate to be, you know, there and actually benchmark uh, full line bandwidth for eight 200 gigabit NICs on a DTX A100, which is 162 GIB to a single mount point, single client. Uh, that is a world record in the world of NFS3. Most people will tell you NFS3 doesn't perform. And I'm like, that's because A, it's not a file system like uh, Sven pointed out, it's a protocol. And it matters what you do with the endpoints of the protocol. So we have massive parallelism in the cluster itself, and we have massive parallelism of the client side. The combination of the two pretty much takes takes all limits off as far as how much um, how much performance we can get from a single system. We're getting tight on time. There are two questions, and I, I have a slide I want to show at the end because we've got a big announcement coming up, first of August that I want to get to, but. The question about caching in NVMe, and then another question about overhead. I don't know if we can like get that in a minute. That's a that might be a one we have to follow up on. Okay, I'll do it very quickly then. Uh, yeah, uh, if no caching mechanism, uh, what will be doing the functionality? So yeah, of course things are different if you design a system for all flash right from the beginning. Right, most of the other vendors for them it's an afterthought. They think okay, we just stick some NVMe drives into a system that was originally designed for a spinning disk, yeah, then you're not taking really advantage uh, of all the good things that come with uh, all flash, right? So the fact that we don't have any cache is only possible uh, because we designed the system for all flash in the first place. That's a good point, right? It's not retrofitted, no compatibility for hard drives. Um, yeah, so, so the, the NVMe, the storage class memory, I should mention, we are loose as to what we can use there. Uh, we started out with 3D Crosspoint uh, from Intel, also known as Intel Optane. Uh, that by no means is the only thing that can, will work there. That is a non-volatile because we store no volatile data anywhere in the entire cluster. And, uh, and that's one of the key designs that we have. Two, it should be low latency. It's not as low latency as RAM, but it's low enough that we can eliminate read and write caching for this whole thing. And the third most obvious reason is endurance. We want high endurance for these because we are going to use it to mask the endurance limitations for the dense NAND below. And so the combination of those three basically means that even in the absence of caching, uh, we have a system which is overall stateless. You could power it down when you come back up, all the state is absolutely there in place. There are no batteries. There's nothing to worry about losing data and cache because we have no cash. Mm. Great explanation. So I know we're right at time here. Again, thank you everyone for staying on. I mean, one of the best things I love is that like, we just got, everybody stays on here. We don't see any drop off. It's just fantastic. So I think Sven and Kartik, great content. I love that we got, you know, just the chance to answer so many questions. So I do want to talk about what's coming next. On August 1st, we have a very big announcement, right? So this is where we're going to be effectively showing you what we've been working on for a very long time. So our engineers have been working on creating essentially a, a giant deep learning data centric stack. It is going to be the next phase, the next evolution that started with universal storage and is moving forward. So you know, click on uh, on up you know, on, on uh, buildbeyond.ai.com. We're really excited about this next next release. Um, so we hope you'll join us there. Kartik and Sven, thank you for your time today. I, I, these are always great. And again, thank you everyone for just your awesome questions. I, I, when we get this kind of interaction, it just makes it so much more fun. So it's something I look forward to every month. And uh, I will let you know what the next topic is for our next uh, office hour session. Thank you everyone for joining today. Again, just, you know, thank you so much. We really appreciate all the feedback.